Welcome to episode four of the Stronger by Science podcast. In this episode, Greg shares some feats of strength, I defend myself against methamphetamine accusations, and we both discuss some funny stuff we stumbled across on PubMed. This episode also features plenty of talk about how dietary supplements are regulated, including an interview with Rick Collins, who is the top steroid and supplement lawyer in the country. Thank you for listening and enjoy the episode. I'm your host, Eric Trexler. I'm here with temporary co-host, Greg Knuckles. Greg, how are you doing? Doing well. How are you? Uh, I'm not well, Greg. I'm not well. Tell me about it. Um, so, Greg, you know, I started lifting when I was 12 years old, right? Yes. And the thing about 12-year-olds is largely they don't know how to lift. And the result of that is I have a, a pretty bum hip at the moment. Okay. Um, so three of the last four nights I've woken up with very, very bad hip pain, bad enough that it wakes me up. So there's three things going on here. First of all, not sleeping well sucks. I think we can agree. So that that's strike one. The second part is being in pain also sucks. So I've got that going against me. Well, yeah, but it's also the only reliable way to know that you're still alive, according to Lincoln Park. <laughs> the only, the, the only reliable way. Um, so, correct. I mean, it's it's got its pros and cons. Now, I think number three is the one that really strikes a nerve, though. Okay. So, it's inviting a comparison that I've been trying to escape my whole career, and I think you know what I'm referring to, but. Around the time I won my second pro card, everyone was saying, you know, the next Bo Jackson. (laughs) And if there's any millennials listening, Bo Jackson was a a pro bowl running back. He was an all-star baseball player. He was kind of, back in the day, he was like the athlete, dual sport athlete. But his career was cut short because he had a he had a, a hip dislocation, a bad hip problem. So for me, it's like I respect Bo Jackson. Everybody does. He did it first. He was yeah. a great dual sport athlete, and as a dual sport athlete myself, I respect him. But I've kind of been trying to get away from that that kind of comparison. And I mean, you know this. When we started working together, I told I was very transparent about my goals, and I, I told you straight up. I want to prove to everybody that I'm as smart as I am athletic and handsome. <laughs> and the more people drag me into this Bo Jackson comparison, it's the harder and harder it is to get up that hill. Eric, ju- just remind me again, what, uh, what two sports are you, are you pro in? Oh, good point. Um, cause that's another thing that kind of irritates me about the comparison. So I am a pro natural bodybuilder. And I'm a pro natural classic bodybuilder. So I'm not in that world. So so Correct. just fill me in here because I'm the ignoramus at the table. Those are completely different sports, right? Right. So like you come from strength and conditioning. Yeah. And so do I. And so when you start working with the team, when you're planning out a year of training, the first thing you do is basically a needs analysis. Yeah. So what physical capacities need to be trained and developed over this year yeah and and so like for you those sports it's like comparing 100 meter sprint and the marathon a marathon and and like swimming sprints yeah yeah like it's completely different they're they're certainly not sports where one could win a pro card in both of them at the same event or if they did they'd have to be an absolute legend the second part yes okay yeah so yeah if if you're bo jackson it's like i need to train for american football and baseball there's a lot of overlap there. But for me, it's like, not to make a metaphor, but I'm, I'm chasing two different rabbits at the same time. And as much as I respect Bo, I feel like it kind of minimizes my capacity to, to balance those sports when you say, oh, it's just another Bo Jackson. Um, but again, for me, it's just like, if I wanted to do the, the route where I just said, oh, hey, I'm another extremely athletic, handsome person and do the whole... Mike O'Hearn, Greg Plitt thing. I could have done that. But for me, the whole point is I, I want to really emphasize the intellect. And so I'm just, I'm just frustrated and tired and I'm, I'm hurt. 
and and now I'm fighting against that. And, and you're afraid that the hip injury is going to just invite those comparisons again. I just think I'm never going to get out from Bow Shadow. That's, you know, maybe you should lean into it. Maybe you should put Bow in your shadow. I mean, like these days, people talk about you know Ladanian Tomlinson or Marshall Falk or Priest Holmes. No one talks about Red Grange, who is the first great pro running back. That's I mean, true. I mean, so you can be the LT to Bo Jackson's Red Grange. I'm just going to keep trying my best. And, you know, I've been doing six months of very bodybuilding focused training. And I think while my hip hurts, I'm going to transition to a completely different approach and just kind of play up the classic bodybuilding for now. And <laughs> maybe when the hips better get back into it. Good luck, man. I appreciate it. Um, but I'm not, I'm not the only elite athlete out there. Um, you were telling me earlier that you dug up some pretty incredible feats of strength this week. Ah, uh, yes. So some crazy stuff has happened over the past week, or by the time you're listening to this, some crazy stuff happened approximately a month ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to butcher this name, but Andrei Sapoznikov, a uh, Russian guy, benched 601 at 198 or 272.5 at 90 kilos. Uh, first 600 pound bench in that weight class, heaviest triple body weight bench ever. Um, dude's obviously not drug tested, but who cares? Uh, that's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Like look up the video for this. It, it's very solid, like very, very good looking bench press. And like, I'm one of those people who, quite frankly, is very pro-extreme arch in the bench press. I think, you know, it, it, I, th I think that's like the Fosbury flop of powerlifting. Like, someone could be a purist in the high jump and try to still go over the bar forward, but if they did, they'd be an idiot. Like, the way I see it is, if you can arch for the bench press, like, it's allowed within the rules, sure, take advantage of it. But if you're, if you're someone who's kind of a purist and you want to see a reasonably long bench stroke... This this guy does actually have a pretty long bench stroke, so aesthetically, I think it it will please a lot of people as well. So, you you often mention during feats of strength like so and so's clearly not drug tested, but I don't care. Yeah, were you ever that young lifter that like you would see the drug tested value and you'd be like, I think I'd totally hit that if I were on drugs. No. So there was so I, I was actually the opposite kid. Um, so one of the first things I ever did that was like reported on the internet was way back in the day I used to post a lot on the 100% raw powerlifting forums. Uh, that's where I did a lot of my early meets because they have a big presence in North Carolina. Um, and I remember like someone failed a drug test. I don't know who. And everyone was like, freaking out about it and being like super moralistic and i was just like guys like who cares like this is powerlifting none of us are making any money off of it like you know you, you either do this sport for self-development so you're just training against your own pr so like who cares what other people are doing or you're just trying to be the strongest dude and like you know i want to be the strongest dude i don't want to be the strongest dude with an asterisk so like I want to be stronger than the guys using drugs as well. Uh, like, those are the numbers I'm shooting for. And, like, I think you guys are making a mountain out of a molehill here. So, like, I'm I'm very pro drugs and professional sports. That's probably another conversation for another day. But, yeah, like, even when I was, like, 15 years old, that was my perspective. And then that got shared on Powerlifting Watch. And people were like, ah, who's this dumb kid? Like, you have to maintain the sanctity of drug-free powerlifting. <laughs> it's like... Guys, like, this is our fucking hobby. Like, don't make that big of a deal no, about it. Powerlifting but. is America's pastime. Sure. Um, but anyway, uh, I was I was not that kid. So my reaction to that, I was always bodybuilding first. Like, I did a powerlifting meet, but it was just to stay interested yeah. between bodybuilding competitions. And I remember very distinctly when I first got into bodybuilding and made some, like, pretty decent beginner gains because I started eating for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I remember very vividly thinking, if I were to go on drugs, I would probably be Olympia-level talent. 
And in hindsight, I was so stupid. <laughs> like, I, I was like, okay, so I, I've gained a decent amount of weight in the last three months. If I continue that linearly forever <laughs> and also yeah. add drugs on top of that, surely I'm going to be like, at that time, Jay Cutler was like king. I yeah. was like, I think I could take Jay. And, you know, uh, I, I kind of feel bad for Jay Cutler because like he came right after Ronnie and I, yeah. rem- I remember even during Jay Cutler's reign, which which was one of the longer reigns in the history of of IFBB. Yeah. Um, everyone, everyone still typically held Ronnie up as like, oh yeah, this guy's awesome. Like even when, even when the next dude was on top, yeah. and like and like I don't see people now during the era of Phil Heath saying like, well, man, Jay was a freak. Like yeah. there, there's not the same wistfulness about the Jay Cutler era as there was for the Ronnie Coleman era. Yeah, and then like now it's Sean Roden, right? Yeah. But no, I, I remember um, I was explaining to to my girlfriend about Ronnie Coleman because that documentary came out, right? Yeah. Um, and when when you're not into bodybuilding, big people just look like big people. Yeah. And I was like pleading with her, please understand that this man is different. <laughs> like, I think part of it was nostalgia and part of it is he truly was different. No, but for sure. like, yeah, Jay had no chance of living up and filling those shoes. Like it's like whenever like a legendary coach retires in a sport and it's like, who's got a coach after this guy? Yeah. Like who's going to coach Duke basketball when coach K steps down. That's like the worst job on the planet. No, for sure. Like you have no chance. Or like when Jordan retired for the second time. Yeah, and yeah. the Bulls had like a fire sale, and it's like, well, <laughs> Chicago's fucked for a while now. <laughs> yeah, I just want to make this very clear because we might have some new listeners joining in that don't get the sarcasm. I'm an absolute garbage bodybuilder, and I don't consider bodybuilding a sport. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you're still with us after like 15 minutes of me being a complete ass, that's the truth. Okay, uh, I've, I've interrupted. These, these are some hot takes to start with. I'm. <laughs> I'm uh, apathetic towards people using drugs and drug-tested bodybuilding, and you're anti-bodybuilding. I'm as, not anti-bodybuilding. As, well, anti-bodybuilding as a sport, as the Bo Jackson of bodybuilding. <laughs> so my thing, so with bodybuilding as a sport, I don't want to get on a huge tangent. It's it's not that I, I just couldn't be bothered either way, if you consider it a sport or not. Um. Cause I've seen people get very angry at people suggesting bodybuilding to sport. And I've seen the opposite as well. Yeah. I just, I just don't think that something must be considered a sport for it to be cool and enjoyable. Like no, I love I, bodybuilding. I, I feel you. And, and so to like nuance what I was saying about powerlifting as well is like, if I thought it had any reasonable ch- shot at getting into the Olympics, then I'd probably care a lot more. But like, I think every day that goes by, it gets further from the Olympics. Like the Olympics are are considering kicking weightlifting out, and really? like yeah, oh my god, um, because so many of the successful countries have failed so yeah. many tests, um, and so like <clears throat> you know, weightlifting's been in the Olympics since what, like nineteen oh four, something like that. So it has the history. It it's already has low ratings like that's another reason that they're kind of willing to kick it to the curb because you know people don't tune in to watch weightlifting for the most part um and like i say this as a power lifter like weightlifting is an objectively more entertaining sport to watch like people are moving quick uh it's got the nascar factor as well like oh, pe- yeah. people watch nascar for the wrecks like there there's often some some gnarly injury when you're watching weightlifting which like is bad but like we'll get some casual viewers to to tune in and so like as long as weightlifting's on thin ice they're not letting powerlifting in right and if they kick weightlifting out they're not doing it to make room for powerlifting yeah like that 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 should be a clear indication that powerlifting has no shot so like it's an amateur sport. It's always going to be an amateur sport. If there, if there were like big money meets uh, for drug tested powerlifting, I would see it somewhat differently because like then you actually have something tangible on the line. Yeah. But as long as it's just like you know, y- you go lift, 
if you're the best, that just means you get a medal that's a different color from other people, but you don't actually get anything tangible for it. Like, who cares, guys? Like, just yeah. just lift weights, try to beat your own PRs, and that's the way I see it, at least. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, like I said, I, I love bodybuilding, and I, I couldn't imagine not having it there. Like, yeah. I don't plan to compete anytime soon, but if you told me you would never compete again, that I'd be, like, a little bit shook by that. Like, it's mm-hmm. it's always got to be there. But um, for me, it's I'm just intrigued by the science. Yeah. I just think it's wild yeah. when I, like, kind of starve to death, and I can <laughs> feel it. And I'm like, whoa, what's happening? This is crazy. Um. But yeah, so that's why I've never really gotten worked up about that that conversation of sport or not sport. I'm like, I don't know, call it what you want. It's still cool. It's yeah. still fun. No, I, I feel you. Anyway, I interrupted you. You were a quarter of the way through our feats of strength segment. Yeah. Um so so pivoting from a very much not drug free person to someone who I at least assume is drug free, competes in the USAPL, uh, Ashton Ruska. Um it might still be a junior if not he just he's very recently out of the juniors um had a 2000 pound gym total in the 93 kilo class uh 715 squat 480 bench 805 deadlift um squat and deadlift both looked absolutely immaculate probably still more left in the tank uh the bench looked really solid was touch and go probably won't hit that much with a pause but probably still something in maybe like the 460 range, but like, God damn, he's strong. Um, like I remember when, when Jesse Norris came out and totaled, I believe it was like 1850 way back in the day in like 2013 or so. Everyone was like, this kid is untouchable. Went on to total 2033 in the 198 class. Um, which at the time was just miles ahead of everyone else. Um, just looked, yeah, looked completely untouchable. And so Ashton's not yet at the level that Jesse was at his best, but like he's, he's very quickly approaching it. Um, and he's still young. And what I've heard is that he doesn't cut to make weight. So he probably still has another four or five pounds that he could gain and still be in that class. Um, so yeah, like it's a gym total, but like Still, 2,000 pound total under any circumstances in that weight class is absolutely outrageous. So it'll it'll be really interesting to see what he does uh, in the next year or two. Yeah, and you've got that 2,000 pound bias. I, I feel like you bring that number up often because that's, that's the number you shoot for. Well, I mean, it's also just a nice round number. It is a very like, nice round number. I mean, it's... Yeah, it's just a cool number. Yeah. Um... I mean, it's either, it's a ton in Imperial or metric, and there's a lot more people who could shoot for a 2,000 pound total than a 2,203 pound total, you know? Um, However, speaking of people who totaled a metric ton, um, Luke Knoll, a junior lifter, um, hit a 1035 total in his first meet. So that's 1035 kilos to 2,281 pounds. Um, I think he did that in the USPA, which like one, I think, so I think if he would have got his last deadlift, that would have put him in the top 25 of all time. I think the, the 2,281 puts him at number 34, 35 all time. But again, like, this dude's 23. He's a junior, and this is his first meet. So, that's outrageous. His first meet. Yeah. Good grief. I mean, like, so something something that that I feel like is still true, maybe less true than it once was. Um, But, like, I used to say all the time, like, there's a ton of very strong people out there that just haven't done a powerlifting meet. And, like, I used to say that, and people said I was crazy. And then, like, one day Ray Williams shows up to some, like, local meet in Alabama and squats 905, which at the time, uh, he got red-lighted because he took a step forward before the rack command, but, like, that would have been an American record. And I think it's still, like, top five, top ten drug-free squat of all time. Um, And, like, when that happened, I was like, ha, told you. So, wait, that was, he just came out of nowhere and, and just... 
put that number up. And yeah, like, and and the interviews with him afterwards were wild. Um, they were just like, "Where'd you come from?" <laughs> it basically, and people were like, "Oh, what's your training like? Like you're, you know, you're clearly the best squatter in uh, at least in drug drug tested feds in the world right now. Like, how did this occur?" Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, he's like, I don't know, man. I've just been lifting weights. Uh, really had no idea what I could squat. So I just wanted to come out to this meet and be able to use some equipment to see what my max was. And they're like, what? And he was like, yeah, I was going to try a thousand, but the bar couldn't hold it. Um, so he had been training at like a local YMCA or something. And the most the bar there could hold was... Uh, I think it was, I think it was eight plates, like 765. Yeah. And so like, that's all the bar could hold. So that's just what he had been training with. And once he got to where he could do sets of 10 with that, he's like, yeah, let's do a meet. Good grief. That's (laughs) crazy. It it was something just wild like that. Um, That kind of reminds me, um, I'm probably going to fudge the details here because it was a million years ago and it was a dude like actually at my gym. mm -hmm. So I didn't like read about it and kind of commit it to memory, but. I remember there was this guy in our gym who was in awesome shape Mm -hmm. and he did a master show just like, you know, walked into some amateur natural bodybuilding show and won. Mm -hmm. And then two weeks later took, I think first or second at worlds Mm -hmm. on the, at the pro level. (laughs) And so whenever, whenever people get discouraged or they've been like working at a pro card for a while and haven't gotten it, I'm like, some dude probably showed up to that amateur show could have been the second best bodybuilder in the world that day (laughs) and didn't turn pro yeah like there's this little bit of luck that always goes into it but yeah you never know when someone someone is going to literally just world class out of nowhere just walk up to a show well and, and, and like that's the thing with any sport that's not one of the major sports in the world right so like there are probably people who could be all pro football players that have never played football or like all pro basketball players that have never played basketball. But but one has to at least assume that most of the talents out there has at least given the sport a try and has wound up in the NBA or NFL. And like in a perfect world, if there was a perfect talent identification system and everyone who was the most gifted was like forced into those sports, like, yeah, like they could probably get better. But it's probably it's probably doing pretty well as is. But yeah, in a sport like powerlifting or bodybuilding, well, in an activity like bodybuilding, <laughs> um, or, or to a lesser degree, weightlifting, like you can't tell me that USA weightlifting wouldn't be better if weightlifting was a bigger sport in the U.S. than football. You know, um, y- you just never know who is out there that has never heard of the sport and as soon as they hear of it they're just going to come in and fuck everyone up you know yeah it's crazy yeah so we've got um, we've got one more right one we do more yes strength. um so the last one is and i'm probably going to butcher this name as well but uh daiki could could kodama yeah kodama daiki kodama um japanese guy uh bench pressed um 529 at 161 so that's uh 240 at like 73 and a half kilos which this guy like he's a legend he's been competing since 2001 um so he's he's a legend on two different levels he's won a ton of bench press world championships um he's benched i believe 300 kilos in single ply in that same weight class which is bonkers um he's also a legend because he is just a bench bro incarnate um so he mostly does bench only meets he has done a few full power meets um the most recent one he actually did this april um and he squatted he squatted 320 deadlifted 380 and benched 490 (laughs) um crazy which, like, I, I haven't seen video of that meet, but what I've heard is that those aren't token lifts. Like, those are actually something approximating max squats and deadlifts as well. Um, but yeah, dude dude is just bench bro for life. Uh, and one of... So, the, the 529 he recently hit, uh, to be clear, that was a gym lift. But the thing that makes that so impressive is if he did that in a competition, 
it would um, it would tie him with the best Paralympic bencher in his weight class, which for anyone that doesn't know, um, like all of the best benchers in the world in the lighter weight classes compete in the Paralympics. Um, like not to be insensitive, but if you don't have legs or if you have severely atrophied legs, um, you can just put on way more muscle in your upper body while meeting a particular weight class. Um, so yeah, like anything below, I want to say like the 181 slash 183 class, like the Paralympic benchers are, uh, just miles ahead of everyone else. And if, uh, Kadama hit that, um, 529 bench in competition, that would tie him with the Paralympic world record, which it can't be overstated how impressive that is. Yeah. Yeah. I, the Paralympic benching, if if you're listening, you've never watched it. it. It's just absolutely incredible. The loads that those guys can put up. Oh yeah. Men, men and women, but, but yeah, I mean, just the weights that they're pushing is it's just absolutely insane as a function of body weight. Yeah. So just for context, um, probably the most, at least in my opinion, the most impressive Paralympic bencher is uh, Sharif Othman. Um, I think he's from the UAE. No, I think he's, I think he's Egyptian. Whatever. Doesn't matter. Uh, so he competes in the 123 class and he benches 455, which is, which is outrageous. Um, that's that's over 60 pounds better than the non-paralympic record which the non-paralympic record in that weight class is 391 which is still crazy impressive at 123 yeah. um but yeah man like the paralympic benchers are are outrageous um i always feel stupid when i quibble about like which incredible world record is better than the other <laughs> yeah it just makes me feel so stupid no i mean b- both of those are just stupid numbers but yeah. so, but still so like i'm not a terrible bencher but my be- my best bench i did reverse grip and that was 485 um but the best like normal like pronated grip bench i've ever done is 455 um yeah. and again like I, I'm not a particularly great bencher, but I'm okay. And like this dude's doing that amount at 123. Like I, I think I think that's the thing that that sticks out to me. Like Jesus Christ, that guy's strong. Yeah, that hurts. Well, I don't want to steal all the limelight, but I have a feat of strength of my own. Um, Go for it. So this is a a walk down memory lane. Um, back in the day, DMAA also known as geranium root. It was in like every pre-workout on the market, right? I mean, it was all over the place. Yeah. And it wasn't banned by anybody. Like there was not a single natural bodybuilding federation that had it banned at one point in time. And so back in the day, um, I I had always been fixated on the 300 pound bench because before I learned about all these strong people, that seemed like a big number. (laughs) 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 <laughs> but one day back when DMAA was all over the market and it wasn't illegal and it wasn't banned and even sport federations hadn't banned it yet. I got super hopped up on DMAA and I broke the 300 barrier. What was your PR before that? Um, I, I think um, I was like very focused on 300. So I think I went for it like a billion times. So <laughs> I think I had done 295. Like Okay, okay. <laughs> Like a hundred times, yeah. But 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 it wasn't like a thirty pound PR out of nowhere. No 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 no, not at all. Okay, but uh, but what happened after that was the really interesting part of the story. Um, so I, I had a a drug test for an employer, and I, I remember <laughs> when I walked out the door to go take the drug test, my mom was like, "You're not going to fail, are you?" And I was like, "Oh, I hope not." Uh, and then I did. <laughs> <laughs> So I was supposed to start work on Monday and it was like, you know, a few days before they called me. They're like, yeah, we're not going to have you work your shift on Monday. And I was like, why? What did I do? And they're like, well, your drug test results came back and you had meth in your urine. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, that's that's ridiculous. I haven't had meth in weeks. Um, 
No, I did not say that. Um, I, I said, surely there's a mistake here. And so what happened was they sent the sample off to a different lab, and, and then they found out that it was just structural similarity between mm-hmm. DMAA and methamphetamine. So they're like, no, you're fine. Come on in. <laughs> but that was probably the first time in my life that I was like, how do supplements get regulated? Like, like what theoretically could be found in these things? And so if you're a reader of Stronger by Science, uh, we recently put up an article Um, called supplement regulation and the subheading is are dietary supplements unregulated Um, and so it's pretty wild when you look into it i mean like when did you start using supplements yourself um (laughs) about six months after i wanted to start using supplements so i started lifting uh all of the big guys at the gym said, you got to take protein powder. That's going to make you big. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, so like my parents, they didn't have any background in strength training at all. Um, so when I said, hey, can you can you get me some protein powder like from Walmart? They're like, mm, are you sure that's safe? And I was like, I think so. Like <laughs> all, all the cool kids are doing it. Um, and they're like, well... I just don't feel comfortable with you taking that. Um, so how about how about we get you some meal replacement shakes that have a lot of protein? So I said, okay, sure. Like, whatever. We can do that. I wasn't that reasonable. I, like, threw a hissy fit because that's when I was, like, young and hormonal and whatnot. Sure. Um, but anyway, so so that's what they did. They got me some Ensure shakes, um, which are... Like meal replacements, primarily for for elderly people. Yeah. Um, and that just did not go well. Like <laughs> they're they're so thick. They they, they roughly are. have the consistency of molasses. Yeah. And they it said on the on the can high protein, but high protein was like ten grams. Yeah. So you know the bros at the gym were saying you got to get thirty grams of protein immediately post workout. So I had to like chug three Ensure shakes after a workout. <laughs> Um, and like, I would very consistently down them, feel really bad and just like vomit 45 minutes later (laughs) because that volume of insure, um, you know, on a virtually empty stomach after a workout, like it just did not agree with me. Um, and so one drinking three insure shakes every day wound up being relatively expensive for my parents and B, uh, they thought that I was just like, I don't know, like acting or something, like throwing it up. And I'm like, no, like I don't, I don't play that way. Like I'm not that invested in getting protein powder (laughs) that I'm going to induce myself to vomit literally every day. Um, So after a few months of that, they, they relented and let me get protein powder. And so that's when I started taking supplements. Now, do you at all feel guilty that you probably deprived like dozens of geriatric patients from the nutrition that they very severely needed from stealing all the insure from the store no (laughs) fair enough i i I don't think that's how markets work i think i was increasing demand and they would if anything they were probably like hey let's get into some new flavors yeah we got a hot market here well yeah so (laughs) the thing so after i i had that run in with the uh the methamphetamine test um that was the first time i had any interest at all in how they were actually regulated and yeah. I think it's really common to hear people say like, oh, everybody knows supplements aren't regulated. And um, I mean, the, the real key take home message of the article is that's not true. Um, if you view it as a binary thing, are they regulated or not? They are indeed regulated by the federal government. Obviously, this applies to the United States. Every every jurisdiction varies a little bit. But the um, probably the the second point of the article is yes, they are regulated, but it kind of doesn't matter. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, the, the regulations, um, even when they just try their damnedest to enforce them, it's a really difficult thing to enforce. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you know, the government's there to make sure that companies aren't making ridiculous claims. Um, the government's there to make sure that they're not obviously selling things that shouldn't be supplements. But even in those very basic things, they, a lot of times they come up short, mm-hmm. you know? Um, one of the examples of this is um, 
you probably remember back in the day, pro hormones were everywhere. Yeah, I mean, just, and, and and by pro hormones you mean steroids. I mean hormones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, but you you would go to the supplement store and they, there were all these basically potent oral anabolics. Yeah. So so just for anyone listening, like a pro hormone is something that will get converted into a active hormone in your body. Um, and like a, a lot of hormones are pro hormones. So like testosterone is it is a hormone but it's also a pro hormone for dht for right. example um but most of the time if like a medical professional was talking about pro hormones say for for anything related to to testosterone or building muscle they'd probably be talking about either dhea or androstenedione dione um or dione depending how you pronounce it um and like both of those if you're like a healthy person and have normal testosterone levels like they don't do anything um they're probably just going to get aromatized into estrogen. But like th- those are those are pro hormones. Uh when shit like superdrol was on the market, like superdrol is a steroid. Like <laughs> like I don't know if like one tiny thing about it is like changed in like first pass liver metabolism or something like that, but like superdrol is a fucking steroid. So like when when a bunch of things were on the shelves claiming to be pro hormones, like if they actually did anything, they weren't pro hormones. Yeah. And so as a loyal follower of Stronger by Science, you know that we like to be evidence-based when possible. And uh, a couple of the really crazy things, it's one thing to say like, hey, things don't seem to be enforced very well. But there actually is some peer-reviewed research on exactly how poorly that's gone in the past. <laughs> um, and the, the, the one person who's really pushing a lot of that research out is Peter Cohen. And so I'm, I'm looking at a study he published. I think this one was 2014, but he basically followed up. Um, this particular one was looking at a lot of those anabolic oriented uh, mm-hmm. compounds and, and some others as well. But he basically said, let's go buy a bunch of supplements just in retail locations, but let's buy a bunch of things that the FDA has already recalled mm-hmm. uh, for the presence of these identified banned substances. And let's just see. If we go in later and try to buy them after the recall, how much of it is, how many of them are actually fixed? Like, did the recall actually accomplish what they hoped? Yeah. So theoretically, if something gets recalled, it'll either stay off the market or when it reenters the market, it will no longer have whatever it got recalled for. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm trying to, it it says um, they, they purchased these things a mean of 34 months after they were recalled. So that's that, that. That should be plenty of time to make changes, right? Thirty-four months. We're talking three years. Yeah, you, you can't say it's just product that was still on the shelves, right? So, so the average was about three years after. Um, <laughs> when they looked at at the sample, um, a full two thirds of them, <laughs> three years after the recalls. <laughs> oh, that's um, great. Still contained uh, one or more banned ingredients hell yeah now another example of like the glaring examples of of kind of shortcomings Mm -hmm. of of regulation are when it comes to some of the um i guess you call them synthetic uh stimulants yeah some of these like non-caffeine other stimulants Mm -hmm. that are kind of finding their way Uh, so dmaa was one of them the fda got some adverse event reports the fda reviewed whether or not it legally met the definition of a dietary ingredient Mm -hmm. um do you do you you want to get into that like how something can become a supplement because i I think i think that's that's a key piece yeah so when it comes to being a supplement um essentially being a permissible ingredient in a supplement product um there's a few ways an ingredient can get onto the market um so the easiest way is if you were on the supplement market as an ingredient as of 1994, it, it's essentially got grandfathered in. So 1994 was when the United States overhauled its federal supplement legislation. And so if, if it was already a supplement in 1994 being sold and traded and, and all that stuff, um, then it was pretty much already good to go unless they were to find out later that it was causing all sorts of adverse events that they didn't know about. Yeah. But the the general premise was, well, it's been on the market already. There must be some pattern of safety if we haven't heard about it yet. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and obviously it's subject to change. If, if, if they find out later, oh, that was really dangerous all along, they can take it off. So that's the simplest way. Um, another way that you can do it is you can make the claim basically that if it's already in the food supply, um, theoretically it should be good to go. So, and, and you can get into the legal definitions. We do that in the, in the mm-hmm. article, but, um, you know, there's some very specific definitions that you could say, well, if it's in, you know, present in the food supply mm-hmm. in a chemically unaltered form, then theoretically th- that inherently shows some level of, you know, inherent safety. It, people have been consuming it in food. So, so just assuming like fish oil supplements didn't exist prior to 1994, you could say like, look, people have been eating fatty fish forever. Like we can sell omega-3 pills. Right, yeah, because it, it's chemically unaltered in terms of the form. It's just lipids from fish. You can put them up in a capsule, and that, that would generally be how that goes. And this is probably a good time to put the caveat. This is, you know, a, a scientist's best interpretation of the law. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a lawyer by any means, uh, but I did have Rick Collins look at the article in, in very good detail. And actually, this episode, we, we've got a, a full-length interview with him, which is pretty sweet. But, um, but yeah, so I, I basically like, it's a, as far as I can tell, yeah, that, that would be an example of that, that particular, uh, I don't want to call it a loophole, but an exemption. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Now you, and you could go another route and basically just say, I have a new dietary ingredient and, and you would, um, you know, notify the FDA of why you think it, it meets the legal definition of a supplement and w- essentially kind of you have to let them know like hey this is coming on the market and obviously they have full autonomy to reject that app or that um, notification if you say Mm -hmm. hey i'm bringing a new thing to the market in 75 days within those 75 days they could look at and say uh no you're not yeah but people generally don't like to ask for permission they'd much rather ask for forgiveness Mm -hmm. and so what a lot of companies will do is they'll either just say oh we're exempt from that because this is already in the food supply and they'll just put it out on the market. Even if I don't know, maybe it's not in the food supply. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another really awesome way to do it. This was the one that, that blew me away, honestly. Yeah. I still, after reading it, after looking into it deeper, after reading FDA materials, after speaking to a supplement lawyer about it, I still don't get it. (laughs) But as, be- as far as I can tell, to my <laughs> my best approximation of what I found out, you can do something that's called self-affirmed, generally recognized as safe, is the designation. And uh, so there's this whole list of like food additives that the government went through, like had a big committee and said, they, they were kind of like overhauling the legislation of all food additives, not just dietary supplements. And they're like, these are the ones that generally we're going to recognize as being safe, you know, have at it as long as it's in reasonable amounts, you know? Yeah. So they made this big old list and now there's enough wiggle room in the supplement legislation that as far as I can tell, companies can, can do something called self-affirming that an ingredient is generally recognized as safe. And I guess what that entails is basically like you get a few people and you make a safety panel. They uh, congregate and evaluate the safety of this ingredient and then they determine it's safe you know i think that's a brilliant system because i can't even conceive of any way that conflicts of interest could affect what gets released well that would only be a problem if people valued uh wealth over the 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 public good which never happens which would not be the case yeah so, so the thing that I, I asked Rick about when I was talking to him, because Rick kind of wrote in a, a position statement for the ISSN talking about supplements. He's like, yeah, companies are using this and the FDA is not very stoked about it. So he suspects that they're going to they're going to maybe tweak that language a little bit. But I was like, who can who can be on this committee? And he's like, ah, no one really knows. <laughs> and I was like. Well, who do you have to send the report to after the committee meets and determines this thing safe? He's like, well, you don't really have to send it to anybody. Oh my God. <laughs> it just has to exist. 
So, like, if the FDA happens to come knocking several years later and say, hey, we noticed that you've been affirming this is, you know, generally recognized as safe. How'd you how'd you come to that conclusion? You just, like, find some dusty old document laying around and be like, here's the report we made six years ago. So, yeah, again, that, that's that's wild. Yeah. Again, I, I'm not a lawyer. I tried very hard in good faith to understand <laughs> how this regulation works. And uh I even if, if you look at the article, we go into even greater detail about defining what's a supplement, what's not um, some of the loopholes involved with, with the regulation. But um, I, I did have Rick look over the whole article because, frankly, to be honest, I kind of didn't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I sent it to Rick. I was like, Rick, surely I've misinterpreted a great deal of this. Do you mind just like leading me in the right direction? And the two options are he either... Um, didn't read it (laughs) which i don't think is true or that's just really how it how it is sometimes that's god that's wild so uh we we took that tangent as you were about to talk about dmaa oh yes yeah so the we mentioned the one study the peer-reviewed study that looked at so we you know try to get all these anabolics and other banned substances off the market three years later they're still there now, the same researcher did a, a similar study, um, and this one, I'm looking at the publication date. It was December 2018, and so basically the FDA, after the pro-hormone thing was kind of a thing of the past, theoretically, then they started really fixing their sights on these synthetic um, stimulants, and so the general premise of the study is the same. Um, you know, we, we've got these stimulants that were all banned and the FDA sent out letters and said, hey, these are not allowed to be in supplements. So kindly remove them if you don't mind. And so they went back in and they per- purchased some supplements in 2017. Um, so of the 12 supplements that they purchased in 2017, uh, 75% of them had at least one of the four stimulants that the FDA sent out all these notices about Mm -hmm. and the notices were sent out i I believe three years prior so the 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 first study was 67 percent, and this one was a 75 percent. and the thing that i like (laughs) that i liked about this one um was that a lot of this the um supplements that they were testing they like got a batch in 2014 and then they retested in 2017 Mm -hmm. to basically see are these things still there um but what they found was for one of the one of the uh stimulants dmba um it was not detected in any supplement purchased in 2014 okay none of them um the fda issued a notice about dmba saying in in 2015 the next year they said do not put this in your supplements and then in 2017, four of the 12 <laughs> had it now. <laughs> so so the F- FDA was pretty much just giving an assist to, to the stimulant junkies. Yeah. So like the, the FDA was telling all of these companies like, hey, guys, this stuff works really well. <laughs> Definitely don't put it in your supplements. Yeah. Just just to make that as clear as possible. <laughs> None of them had it in 2014. The FDA very clearly said, please stop using this in 2015. And then in 2017, 33% of them now had it. That's that's great. So the general premise is, um, and, and for more detail, you know, the, the article's up on the site. It, it goes into a lot of the, the nuance, which with, I mean, that's the name of the game with legal stuff. So if I've paraphrased anything incorrectly, I apologize profusely. But the general premise is, are these regulated? Yes. But the companies just don't seem to care or listen. Well, d- didn't you say that a lot of companies have just determined that it's more profitable to pay for fines for violating the law than it would be to actually follow the law and thus have stuff that gives people less of a buzz and make less money that way? It would appear, it's kind of speculation, but just because, I mean, it's so rampant. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It, you would have to assume that some people are basically making a calculated decision of what are the odds that we'll get caught? If we do get caught, what are the odds that anyone will actually call us out for it? And then furthermore, what are the odds anyone will follow up and truly punish us in a way that will meaningfully hurt our business? I mean, honestly, dude, like, 
for a lot of people who are really into supplements, it may be a good thing if your company gets fined. Because, like, especially with the stimulants, I see a lot of people uh, speak wistfully about what their favorite pre-workouts were back in the day. Like, Craze, I know, was a popular one that had some stuff that was then subsequently banned. And so, like, it wouldn't surprise me if, like, some of those folks are just, like, on the lookout for, hey, what companies are getting fined a lot? Like, they're the ones who are slipping the good stuff in, you know? Yeah, I mean, I remember back in the day, like, in the gym, I, I knew friends that absolutely, if they found out that somebody just happened to be selling a steroid in a pill, they'd be like, oh, no way. Like, they, they would be <laughs> stoked. They would go buy it. Yeah, let like you run out and get it before they pull it. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. actually I know uh I like very loosely there was just some dude at the gym that we would chat every now and then. But I remember it was either a I forget if it was a pro hormone or if it was when they they finally took DMAA off the market, but he stocked up. Yeah. Like he was like yeah. I'm not going to be able to get this again. And like he he like really loaded up on it. So yeah, it's 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 an interesting world when it comes to supplement regulation and you know, even now, like the FDA keeps like talking about CBD oil mm -hmm. and um, you know this, I, you and I agree on this, that like it, in terms of drugs, like have at it. I, I don't particularly care. Yeah. You know, like so I'm not I'm not saying that CBD oil shouldn't be a supplement. Like it, as far as I can tell, it seems pretty harmless. I don't know. But it's like sold everywhere as a supplement and the FDA keeps coming out and saying like, Hey guys, it's, it's not <laughs> like, <laughs> they're like, it's just not a supplement. And yeah, so like, they're not yeah. saying, they're not necessarily saying it's dangerous, but the FDA at, at, at the last time I checked, which was like a few days ago, continues to contend like, hey, seriously, guys, please stop selling it as a supplement. <laughs> uh, we set the law and we've determined it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in that case, I actually think the FDA might loosen up and make it a supplement, maybe. Um, but there are some big challenges there. Well, why didn't someone on the front end just say, we, like, me and my buddies generally recognize this as safe? <laughs> well, so you could do that as a means of, like, it, it seems like that is used as a way to not submit a new dietary ingredient notification. Okay. That doesn't necessarily mean that you've now set law, <laughs> you know, like, I gotcha. oh, hey, this is, it, it's basically just like, it's almost like asserting like, oh, something's in the food supply for sure. That doesn't mean it is. It just means that that's why you didn't submit your paperwork that would allow them to review it ahead of time. Okay. I see. So yeah, you, you put it to market and just say, oh no, we looked into it. But then if they, if they're like, well, we reviewed your document and that's ridiculous. <laughs> um, then they could very much take it off the market. and But yeah, it, I, I think a lot of people are just essentially playing a game of chicken of like, you won't, first of all, find out. Mm -hmm. And second of all, even if you do, you're not you're not going to come looking for my documentation probably. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, so with CBD oil, it's just everybody's putting it out there. Um, and the FDA is just very politely asking everyone to stop and they're not. So um, I, I think the FDA might, try to come around and make some kind of weird like patch some law together and just say okay here's how we're going to deal with cbd um but the problem is like it's already in some instances it's already gone through drug approval processes yeah like yeah. There, there have been like different phases of clinical trials for it as a drug yeah and so that's a huge problem well we were uh we were at the fitness summit recently and mike t nelson had to talk about this i if memory serves, he said that there's already a CBD drug on the market. I, b I believe there is. Generally, if something... So, how, how, do, how does that work? Like, can something simultaneously Not well. be classified as a drug and still be sold as a supplement? I think it, it's going to be a big hurdle. I, I think it's going to be a huge hurdle. I mean... Um... I don't know. I mean, off the top of my head, I know that there are pharmaceutical grade supplements that get sold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's going to legally there's there's probably a lot of fine print to be read there. Mm -hmm. But but my very outsider understanding is once something is a drug, it's hard to undrug it and yeah. say, actually, never mind. 
that's a supplement now. It's a lot easier to say, hey, that's a useful supplement. Can we make it pharmaceutical grade to make sure that it's meeting our purity and quality standards? Mm -hmm. So like if, if you go to the doctor and you're vitamin D deficient, they're probably going to get you the good stuff. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, I think there's pharmaceutical grade fish oils as well, maybe. I'm not well, certain. Just because you're being written a prescription for something, does that necessarily mean it's a drug? I mean, we're we're probably not the correct people. We to are not at all. The, yeah, I, I I look specifically <laughs> at supplements, and once somebody says it's a drug, I'm like, okay, not not my concern then. Fair enough. But no, I, enough. I think there's probably some legal distinctions between a pharmaceutical grade supplement and a drug. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, I, I think you can be prescribed a supplement by a doctor that does not necessarily make it a drug. But the CBD oil thing is is it's in, it's interesting and I you look for answers for it. And frankly, the reason it's confusing and the reason that you and I blubber around like idiots because we don't get it is because the FDA doesn't know what to do with it. So like the people who set the rules don't know what to do with it. So how the hell are, are we supposed to know? I am stunned that bureaucrats in the United States government <laughs> aren't one a hundred percent competent in doing their job well and B, aren't communicating to the public with perfect clarity. Yeah. That, that is, uh, that's not within the scope of things that I would expect. Yeah. It's, it's an aberration, but sometimes things happen, man. So with all of this in mind, if you are an athlete or you have a job where they drug test really strictly, what are some steps you can take to make sure you're not going to find yourself in a Trexler scenario where you think you're just taking pre-workout and then you piss hot for meth. <laughs> right. Um, well, definitely don't take meth um, is the safest option. Um, but yeah, you, you know, some people have a lot to lose when it comes to drug testing. You know, you, you compete in a sport federation, you're a pro athlete, maybe your job test if you're like military or, you know, other tactical personnel and you, you can't just risk it. So in that situation, obviously, the, the safest option is to just not take supplements, but a lot of people don't like that that answer. Um, the second safest option would be to rely on third-party testing of supplements. So th there's a big list of companies out there. Um, you can find them all in the article. But basically, what these companies do is they offer independent third-party certification of supplement products. So a company could basically say, we want to get our protein product tested and verified that it's like clean and good to go. And so it, it gives you a lot more faith that the product you're ingesting is up to the quality standards that the certification party sets. Mm -hmm. But that's a really big caveat. There are different levels of third party certification. So the most basic one is just making sure that essentially that the supplement maker is following good manufacturing practices. And that's a good thing, but that doesn't mean that the product is totally clean. Yeah. It just means that like their factory is not filthy and they have all their paperwork and like they're doing the very basic steps of manufacturing. Yeah. They're, at, they're not putting tainted meth in your pre-workout. Exactly. Putting yeah. Some Walter White grade shit in there. <laughs> exactly. So, so that's like the basic level is like we got our GMP verified. Yeah. Good manufacturing practices. The second level is like some additional testing where they make sure like, okay, it's like, you know, doesn't have poison. You know, it's not like absolutely terrible for you. Which, if I can cut you off right there, sure. that, that's that's a non-negligible issue. Correct. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of this. There was uh, like a c consumer reports report several, several years back looking at... Um, like the big whey protein manufacturers that had products on the market. And I forget which brands were the worst, but like p people are aware of issues with protein, like amino spiking and whatnot. But something a lot of people aren't aware of is like something like 20, 30% of the products on the market, like a non negligible amount had dangerous levels of heavy metals in them. Yeah. Like uh, you got some lead, you got some cadmium, um, like you're 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 flint watering yourself with uh with some of the protein powders on the market so yeah like one would assume that you know the stuff you're taking even if it's free of banned substances like if it is free of banned substances that it's probably safe but like even something as basic as protein like at least in the past in the recent past like i want to say that was 2014 or so yeah um some pretty major issues with shit being in there that shouldn't be 
Yeah. So like an example, the, the Banned Substance Control Group, the BSCG, they've got a, a GMP certification. They've got what they call a certified quality mm-hmm. certification. And so that looks at um, making sure that label claims are met with the identity and the quantity of the ingredients. Um, it'll also test for heavy metals, pesticides, microbial agents, and some other things in there. So it's a step above just saying like, yeah, there's no rats on the floor in the factory and all your paperwork's in line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, there's also like a third tier. And so a, a lot of the big companies that do this third party testing have this like highest tier one. And what they do is they go a step further. They make sure that, you know, the company's on the up and up. Uh, the manufacturing practices are, are legit. They, they do like the basic safety testing and they take it a step further and actually test for like the full WADA panel, the World Anti-Doping Agency list of banned substances. So honestly, I would say if you're at really high risk in terms of like if you fail a drug test, you've got a lot to lose, like a you know pro athlete or like a world class, you know, athlete um, or if you could lose your job from a failed test. Aside from just not using supplements, I think anything below that tier is probably too great a risk to take. Um, so that third tier of like making sure that the whole WADA list has been checked for. And another thing that's probably important to note is like theoretically, you might be subject subjected to testing uh, expectations that are not totally congruent with WADA. Mm-hmm. Um, none come to mind, but theoretically, you know. Um, so you you would want to at least make sure that whatever you're supposed to be tested for that you're checking. I do remember for a while the um, the the testing threshold for caffeine mm-hmm. was more stringent for NCAA than for WADA for yeah. for a while. Um, I can't really think of anything else. Yeah, though. it's it's pretty atypical. Usually, yeah. usually when when a a company or a federation wants to be strict, they just adopt the WADA mm-hmm. policies. But I'm just saying, in theory, if you've got everything to lose, just double check yeah. and, and make sure that the WADA list has you covered if that's what you're relying on. And, and really, man, like as far as performance stuff goes. It's, it's not that hard to just not take supplements, you know? I agree. Um, I, I've i done a lot of supplement research. Um, and the more I study supplements, the less I use. <laughs> like, I think yeah. that's kind of yeah. telling. Um, but yeah, it's like you're going to be just fine even if you don't use. I mean, they're helpful. They're, they're, I do take supplements. You yeah, know? yeah. But um, it, 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 it's like one of those things, if you have that much to lose you really want to be cautious about how much you're taking and and from where you get it. Yeah. Um, (laughs) So I mentioned, you know, I've done a lot of supplement research in my day. We've talked about a couple, a couple studies um, in the literature showing, you know, maybe some shortcomings of implementing some of this FDA oversight, but uh, to play us out uh, a bit of a cautionary tale when it comes to the research. Uh, I think a lot of times, you know, (laughs) Now that like social media and fitness has devolved into just people throwing PubMed links at each other, I think it's kind of subconsciously reinforced this idea that if a thing is on PubMed, it's legit. Like it can essentially be almost taken as fact if it's indexed on in the hallowed indices of of PubMed. Yeah, A, a, a lot of a lot of stronger by science readers will know that that's not the case. Right. But yeah, that, that is that is a general perception that's out there. So um, to play us out, we're, we've just got a little cautionary tale that every now and then when, when you're scouring PubMed, you find some stuff in there that you could throw as a link at someone to prove them wrong and say they're an idiot. But sometimes there's just some weird stuff on there, Greg. Um, yes, there is. So I, I'd like to begin. Go for um, it. I literally just organically came across this paper today. It was somebody sent me an article and this was a reference in it. And they're talking about a, (laughs) an herbal supplement that like, frankly, just does not have much legitimate research behind, like not a ton. It's it's an herbal supplement that's running for president, correct? (laughs) Yes. Yeah, that would. Sure. Um, So the things that it basically has this long list. Well, th- throw out the name of the supplement now, so I don't okay. look like a loon. <laughs> it's Tulsi. 
Okay. Yeah, there we go. Tulsi. Um, yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so a, a little, damn it, Rex. a little list here of the things that, that Tulsi, based on PubMed, which is what I'm reading from here, that Tulsi helps with. Anxiety, cough, asthma, diarrhea, fever, dysentery, arthritis, eye diseases. I don't know what that word is. Hiccups, vomiting, uh, gastric stuff, cardiac and genito urinary disorders, back pain, skin diseases, ringworm, uh, insect bites, snake bites, scorpion bites, malaria. Uh, it's antimicrobial, which includes antiviral, antifungal, antiprotozoal, antimalarial, anti, I don't know what that word is either. Mosquito repellent, um, anti-cataract, chemo preventive, uh, radio protective, hepato protective, neuro protective, cardio protective. Um, I'm just like not even close. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff here. Anti-spasmodic, anti-emetic, anti-arthritic. There's a lot of stuff there, Greg. Yeah. And so just to give an idea, um, there is a total of four or five references for that entire list of stuff. <laughs> so this is a review paper basically just saying these are all the things that this thing does. And when it comes to actually um, providing references for for that evidence, uh, yeah, I, I doubt that all, f- <laughs> all of those things have been rigorously shown in that cumulative total of five studies. Yeah, the the rest of the paper is just a dumpster fire as well. Like uh, above that list you were reading from, uh, Tulsi is also credited with giving luster to the complexion, sweetness to the voice, and fostering beauty, intelligence, stamina, and a calm disposition. So I guess that would be helpful if you're like a, a podcast uh, creator. Sure. A little uh, sweetness to the voice never hurts. <laughs> I think this was my favorite part as well. Um, it was like recommending people grow these plants in their home. Um, and it said placing the living Tulsi plant in the center of the household, therefore has applicability beyond the realms of Hinduism and may play a useful role in addressing modern day issues through embodying the healing power of the natural world and serving as a constant connection to living nature, which like that's a decent sentiment. But I think the part I liked the most is applicability beyond the realms of Hinduism. And one problem I have with a lot of science is there's so much of it that only applies within the realms of Hinduism. And so I'm glad we finally now have a supplement we can take that applies outside of those realms. Yeah, we've really been kind of backed into a corner, keeping everything (laughs) within that particular realm. Um, But yeah, it's just, you know, this plant has cultural and religious significance uh, in the Hindu faith. So I want to be very, very clear that we don't mean to mock or offend or disrespect any particular religion or, you know, the people that follow it. Uh, but when you're reading scientific medical literature, it should never be hard to distinguish between statements that are based on evidence or based on tradition or based on religious doctrine. So I was born into a Catholic family and in Catholicism, we have holy water. I would be 100% equally as perturbed if I was reading a scientific paper and it said, uh, you know, whole, Catholic holy water brings vitality and good health or something along those lines and, and just had absolutely no evidence to substantiate that claim. I mean, tradition and religious doctrine certainly have a place, um, but it, it's probably not the scientific medical literature. So I guess the moral of the story is... Just because something's on PubMed, maybe maybe take a peek at it. Yeah. Uh, my example of that recently is um, not to share not to share too many details, but I came across a paper um, that was looking at so one of the main outcomes was body composition, so um, body fat percentage and um, muscle mass. So body comp, that was assessed via calipers. Yeah, not great, but like calipers are decent. So no problem with that. Muscle mass, if you're unaware, you can't measure muscle mass. Um, You have to predict it by taking some measurements using some sort of regression equation. Uh, But like that's always a prediction. Um, And sometimes you predict it well. Sometimes you predict it poorly. So this was a training study and it wanted to see how much 
um, muscle mass increased in the two groups pre pre and post training. And the equation they used to predict muscle mass um, incorporated things like height, weight, uh, sex, age, ethnicity, like generally decent things to include. But it didn't include anything like, you know, arm girth or shoulders or hips or like leg circumference or anything like that. Or fat thickness or any, anything or, like or that. Or fat thicknesses, yeah. So <laughs> the only one of the variables in that regression equation that could possibly change pre to post training was weight. Because everything else was fixed. <laughs> and so uh, mathematically, necessarily, if that's the regression equation you're using to predict how much muscle increased in the groups... Like, the number one way to look jacked in that formula is just to gain weight as fast as possible. Correct. Like, th that, that is just tautologically true, because that's how math works. Um, which, like, if, if you're using... So, like, it had been validated on the population level to say, like, okay, like, within a population, this gives you a pretty decent prediction. And so, like, yeah, there, there, there would probably be applications for that. But if you're interested in how much muscle mass is increasing pre to post training after a training study, that is that is quite possibly the dumbest thing I could ever think of to try to assess muscle mass. Like, it, and here's the thing: like they already had calipers, so like there there are equations that work reasonably well that can be used to predict um, total upper arm muscle cross sectional area and total upper thigh cross sectional area based on skin fold thicknesses and limb circumferences. Like, they're not perfect, but, like, there are those equations out there, and they, they work fine. Um, it's not as good as something like an ultrasound or certainly an MRI, but, like, th that that is something that you can actually use to predict muscle mass reasonably well. So, like, just the fact that that's what they went for was, was utterly baffling to me. Um, and if you only read the abstract, you would absolutely not get that out of the paper at all not at all yeah so yeah when you're reading an article and and this is a it's great that this comes up when we're talking about supplements because like there are some supplement studies out there that are in in the literature you know indexed on pubmed that you're just like what is happening here <laughs> like it, it seems to very disproportionately in my opinion affect like some small supplement studies where you're just like wait yeah what for happened sure. here um, so when you're reading, you know, some kind of like secondary article, it's just like, oh, and this supplement was shown to work as well. And there's a citation. It's usually a good idea to take, just take a glimpse at it and see what's happening. You know, if, if it talks about how merely being next to the plant has particularly restorative powers, and that's the evidence that the supplement works. Even outside of the realms of Hinduism. Even outside of the realms of Hinduism. Um, yeah, that's... You just want to double check and, and be like, okay, well, there's a research link, but what does the research look like? Yeah. Um, so we've got a real treat to finish up today's episode. We've got an interview with Rick Collins. Now, Rick Collins is one of the top lawyers in the country and probably the world when it comes to the laws pertaining to steroids and dietary supplements. And so he was kind enough to make himself available um, to talk my ear off about everything that goes into dietary supplement regulation and some of the gray areas with supplements. So, um, enjoy. If you've not heard of Rick Collins, that's your fault. He is the the top steroid and dietary supplement lawyer on the planet. He is frequently invited out to the ISSN and NSCA conferences to educate us about the legalities surrounding just about everything in the fitness industry. So without further ado, Rick, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Eric. And something, something that people might not know about you is that you are a remarkably engaging speaker, uh, <laughs> quite a character, and you have an, I believe, an Arnold certified Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. Is that right? I have done my Arnold impression for him the first time I was out at the Arnold Classic in Columbus, Ohio. 
probably around 2002, uh, having been a fan of Arnold since I was 17 years old and a young aspiring bodybuilder. Um, it was uh, amazing to meet him in person. And I was introduced to him at the Arnold Classic. And the person who introduced us said, you know, this is Rick Collins. I'd like you to meet Arnold Schwarzenegger. This was before, of course, he was governor. And I do a little impression of him. And um, so, I, I don't know, uh, starch struck as I was at the time, I, it just sort of erupted out. And as the, he put out his hand, I said, it's super fantastic to meet you. And he was like, why are you doing an impression of me? And I'm like, I, I do. And we went back and forth. And I think he liked it. And I, uh, I wanted the chance to spend a good part of an afternoon with him in his office uh, above uh, Shotzi on Main in, in Venice. Uh, and it was an uh, amazing day. And so I'm, I'm very blessed. As, as you know, Eric, I, I come from a background as a competitive bodybuilder. I was a personal trainer. I helped manage uh, gyms when I was in college. And so for me as a, as a lawyer to be able to have integrated into my practice the things that I'm passionate about, what interests me, the community that I feel connected with since long before I even went to law school, it's a dream come true. They say that if you you know, if you're doing what you really love, you're not working. And and I really do love what I do. I started this firm uh, in 1990, and the division of the firm that I'm in is dedicated to the community of bodybuilders and fitness enthusiasts and dietary supplement companies and sports nutrition folks. So for me, it's uh, it's fantastic, and uh, I'm I'm very happy to do what I do, and I'm happy to be on your show. So was there a time when you realized you wanted to do law school and then you just kind of realized like, hey, there are legal needs in fitness and somebody needs to do this? I wish I was that smart, Eric. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, very often we we just are pushed by the the currents of karma into the place where we're supposed to be. So I had my avocation as a bodybuilder and I've got a attic full of trophies from my competitive days and I ran a, a personal training business for a while trying to get people in shape and but that was sort of outside the scope of my professional journey which was uh, going to law school to be a prosecutor initially and I worked as a prosecutor for five years which is a great place to cut your teeth and really learn how to try a case how to handle yourself in court and then went into private practice. And the irony is that I went into private practice in 1990, which was the very same year that the United States Congress decided to criminalize the possession of anabolic steroids. Just by luck, by coincidence, that happened to happen at the same time that I became available as a lawyer to folks who might run into trouble due to that change in the law. And so as a, as a bodybuilder and somebody who was in the community of strength and health, I started getting calls as suddenly police were engaged into the equation of intense, hardcore fitness. And so I started recognizing early on in my private practice that there was an incredible disconnect between the guys in the gym who had been using steroids for many years before the law changed without really thinking of it as a drug or certainly as a controlled substance along the lines of cocaine or heroin or anything like that. And the legal community, the, the cops, the, the members of DEA, the courts, the prosecutors, everybody in the criminal justice system who suddenly had to, to look at this issue of non-medical steroid use through the same lens that you would be looking at the use of, of heroin or methamphetamine. And so I tried to begin to correct that disconnect. I started writing a column for Muscular Development Magazine, and ultimately the 
the then uh, senior editor, uh, editor in chief, John Romano, convinced me to write a book, which I did called Legal Muscle, which was an exploration of steroids in American law, culture, politics, medicine, sports. And so that book published, oh my God, back in 2002, uh, really became a, uh, a popular book in the bodybuilding community. And uh, I followed that up with uh, continuing my column, writing a lot more about it. And through that, uh, representing large numbers of health and fitness folks in the uh, in allegations of either trafficking in steroids, possessing steroids, using steroids in sports and, and violating um, doping uh, rules, or in some cases, representing cops or firefighters or other people who were subject to drug testing who would test positive for a performance enhancing drug like anabolic steroids or others. And so my entire practice now has essentially uh, been dominated by strength and health and fitness and nutrition and bodybuilding and exercise. So for me, it's, it's really been a complete integration of my vocation and my avocation, uh, not because I planned it when I went to law school, but because that's the way it sort of evolved. And if we're lucky in life, sometimes the, the thing we're meant to do finds us and we wind up where we're supposed to be. And, um, and that's kind of where I am, Eric. That's, that's awesome. Um, I mean, that's kind of our, before we bring somebody on the show, you have to be a meathead first. And then if you have a skill beyond that, that's just icing on the cake. So we've had a bunch of the, the researchers who were pumping iron for 15 years and then said, oh, you can also research this. I didn't know that. So it's, it's, it's perfect. And you really jumped into law at a very interesting time. Um, 1990, there's the steroid uh, legislation. But then, you know, between 92 and 94, the supplement legislation w was just completely revamped. Um, now, you've probably seen this as much as I have. I see all over the place on articles, people saying, now, we all know that the FDA doesn't regulate supplements. Right. Yeah, I mean, we see that all the time, and that's sort of a um, a meme within the mainstream media, and the idea that the the dietary supplement industry is this wild west, completely unregulated, that there's uh, no regulation that exists, and most of most of us, I would think, and many of your your listeners are aware that that's BS, right? Well, if it were true, you'd have a lot more time on your hands, I, I would think. <laughs> I would, yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, fortunately, it's not true because the the supplement industry, of course, is regulated and it's regulated in numerous ways. The FDA has regulatory authority over dietary supplements and there are uh, numerous uh, regulations and statutes that apply. The uh, Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, also has regulatory authority. So if somebody makes a misleading claim about a dietary supplement product or makes a disease claim or a drug claim saying that the product will, let's say, cure Alzheimer's or prevent diabetes, um, the government has the ability to immediately uh, send out warning letters or even more aggressive actions, enforcement actions, to stop a company that does that. Uh, so there's there's lots of regulations. I think what when they say that, what they mean is that the dietary supplement industry is not regulated like the drug industry, and that is true. Dietary supplements don't go through the pre-approval process that prescription drugs need to. So if you want to launch a, a new prescription drug, let's say you want to bring a new statin to market, well, you can't just throw that on the market. You're going to have to do phase one, two, and three clinical trials, and you're going to have to go to the FDA, and you're going to have to get that particular product approved by the Food and Drug Administration before you can bring it to market. With dietary supplements, you don't have to go through that pre-approval process um, like you do with drugs, but you still can't launch a product to the market unless you have 
reason to believe, reasonable expectations that it's going to be safe. And certainly if you make claims about it that are inappropriate or illegal, you can be called to task for that. And certainly if the product hurts anybody, uh, you can be in lots of trouble for that. And I'm sure you've seen the Food and Drug Administration and the U.S. Department of Justice has taken action against companies in the dietary supplement industry and even in the sports nutrition industry, uh, sort of subcategory, um, that uh, are serious and in some cases result in people getting uh, charged with crimes uh, and indicted and convicted and in some cases imprisoned. Yeah. So you mentioned there, there's kind of this, the FDA has some oversight and the FTC. Now the FTC has oversight regarding claims, right. um, including the claims you might see on a, on a supplement label. And a lot of times you'll see on that label, it'll say this statement has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, is that basically just indicating that the statement itself is more in the jurisdiction of the FTC? No, the FTC and the FDA have somewhat concurrent and overlapping authority when it comes to claims. Uh, certainly, mm-hmm. FDA has the authority to, um, to enforce against claims that are on a label of a product. And the FTC's uh, ability to look at claims extends to other sorts of marketing materials or brochures or other things that might um, be uh, include claims about a product. Uh, the recently, the FDA and the FTC sent out joint warning letters. Uh, I think it was only last month to a number of companies regarding the types of claims that they were making. And it was both uh, agencies working in tandem to send out these letters uh, warning companies about what they were doing. And that is uh, an example of sort of the the kind of uh, ways in which the government agencies can overlap or, or uh, connect in their policing of a market. And just because you send out a warning letter or you get a warning letter from from FDA or FTC doesn't mean that's the end of it. Uh, The company then has to respond to it and they have to attempt to correct the uh, the problems. And even if they do, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end of it either. Uh, In some egregious cases, it can go over to a. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office and an assistant U.S. Attorney could get involved, whether uh, in in a civil uh, enforcement action or in some cases in a criminal enforcement action. And I've handled cases involving, for example, disease claims where a company makes claims that are uh, outside the scope of the sort of structure function claims that are permissible for dietary supplements and starts making disease claims. And by disease claims, I mean you know, making claims that a particular product will cure cancer or will uh, reduce uh, the effects of Alzheimer's or will um, ward off diabetes or things like that. And in some cases, the case can be turned over to the Department of Justice and the principal of the company can wind up on uh, on the na- caption on an indictment and can risk going to prison on cases like that. So yes, uh, the the dietary supplement industry is not regulated like the drug industry. But then again, look at what we pay for drugs, right? Prescription drug prices are through the roof. And in part, that's because of the patent aspects of it. And it's also because of the amount of money that needs to go into bringing a prescription drug to market. If every right. company that wanted to bring a vitamin C product had to go through phase one, two, and three clinical trials for that vitamin C product, you know, I don't think the American consumers necessarily want to be paying fifty dollars a tablet for vitamin C. Right. You go get some oranges, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Right. So, so let me just to get the audience up to speed, please correct me if I'm wrong on this. I'd like to get kind of a working understanding of the basic structure. So the FDA and the FTC can and are responsible 
to regulate the supplement market. All supplement companies are federally required to adhere to good manufacturing practices. Yes. And by that, we mean, you know, and, and that was imposed a few years ago, back when the law changed in 1994 and the Congress enacted something called the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, which was the law that really allowed supplement, the supplement market to flourish in the way that it has since 1994. It, the, the essence of that law was to say that, look, supplement ingredients, dietary supplement ingredients, dietary ingredients are, are essentially what we get out of our food, vitamins, minerals, uh, different types of extracts from botanicals. We eat these things. And so they are deemed inherently to be safer than the sorts of synthetic prescription drug ingredients that are created in a laboratory, right? So, right. so that's the essence of it. And so the Deche or Deshea, the, the supplement law, effectively said, we're going to regulate dr- these sorts of dietary supplements, not as drugs, but as food, as a subcategory of food. And so that's what it did. And so, um, but at that time, there was no imposition of standards in how the manufacturing of supplement products would occur. And so it was a few years later that the um, construction of what are called current good manufacturing practices were imposed on the industry. And it was phased in over time. First, it was the really big companies in the industry, then the medium-sized companies, and then ultimately even the smallest companies had to adhere to these things. And so the idea is that you can't go and make supplements in your basement um, or your kitchen and throw a label on and market them in compliance with the law because those things would not be made under the standards of good manufacturing practices. And so um, contract manufacturers or the places that, that manufacture um, by contract, different types of supplement ingredients need to adhere to these regulations, these GMPs, as they're called. And so the GMPs are what helps to assure that a supplement product is made under conditions that are sanitary and uh, where there's quality control and quality assurance. And if a product is made outside of good manufacturing practices. In other words, if somebody just threw a, a, some crap in a bottle and started selling it as a supplement, well, it would not be a legal product because it was made outside of good manufacturing practices. And what the law says is that that product is adulterated because it's not made in compliance with the law. And the um, not only could the, the person who's marketing that uh, ultimately have to do a recall or get in, in trouble for being told not to do it, but it's actually a crime. And that person can be charged with introducing an adulterated and misbranded product into the market. Yeah. So on the topic of GMP, sometimes you'll see a, a product that has a little label on it. That's, you know, it's kind of bragging made with current good manufacturing practices a label like that on a product, is that like me basically bragging that my company pays the taxes that I owe? Like, isn't that just kind of saying like, hey, I don't violate federal laws? Or right. Yeah, a certain redundancy, I guess. Um, well, yeah, I mean, certainly you are bound to adhere to good manufacturing practices. I guess, you know, bragging about it and saying that you're doing it um, is sort of an assurance to some consumers who may not know that supplement companies are bound to certain standards. Yeah. And I, and I guess that's part of the problem too, right? Is that uh, the public is misinformed about supplements. There may be people who, maybe not your listeners, but certainly lay persons who aren't very knowledgeable about health or fitness may have no idea that there are good manufacturing practices imposed on the industry. And so for them, that that's actually news. 
And of course, the, the mainstream media, like we talked about before, isn't helping the situation when they continue to claim that there are no regulations that uh, adhere to dietary supplements or, or apply to supplements. And again, it's, it's just simply not true. Yeah. So I, I do have some questions about specific ingredients that are kind of in the news. But before I get there, you know, we've talked about this post-market regulation. Right. And basically, if you're putting a, a product to market that contains ingredients that were on the market when that legislation went into place mm -hmm. in 1994, right. those ingredients are grandfathered in and, and you do not need pre-approval. No. Now, if you're introducing a new dietary ingredient, you would need pre-approval. Well, Is that correct? We want to stay away from the, the term approval because okay. drugs go through an approval process. And, and sometimes if, we, if, we don't, if we're not clean and neat about our semantics, we can muddy the waters a little bit. So all prescription drugs need to be pre-approved. They got to be approved in order to, to launch them. No supplement needs to be approved. The supplements that contain ingredients that were on the market as supplements in, in prior to 1994, October of 94, when that Deche went into effect, those we could call old dietary ingredients or ODIs. Uh, they're grandfathered in, and that's the way the law was constructed. And ingredients that were introduced to the market after October of 94 would be considered new dietary ingredients. And what the law requires for the new dietary ingredients or NDIs is a higher level of um, apl application or um, uh, review before those products hit the market. And so typically for, for a new dietary ingredient, you need to give notification. It's not approval, but it's notification to the Food and Drug Administration 75 days before you launch the product that this is a product that you're putting on the market. Okay. And so that NDI notification process is required for most NDIs. Now, it gets a little complicated because if an NDI fits a certain exemption criterion, then you don't have to give that notification 75 days in advance. And that is, there's, there's language in the law that says that if it's an article that's in the food supply, an article that's in the food supply in a form that's not been chemically altered and that's, that's used for food, then you don't have to file that notification. And so there, the number of notifications that have uh, gone out are fairly small, interestingly enough. Um, and so some companies may rely on that exemption uh, not to uh, file, not to give a notification on an NDI. Um, and, um, and in some cases, they may be correct. And in other cases, they may not. Um, but again, the idea is unless the ingredient is in the food that we're eating, um, which would help establish a reasonable expectation of safety, then there would have to be some sort of notification. Yeah. The, the, it's important, obviously, that the supplements that we take have a reasonable expectation of safety. Now, you mentioned the exemption of being present in the food supply. Um, and I'm not even going to try to replicate your very careful terminology, <laughs> but you know what you said. We all heard it. Sure. Yep. That's essentially the route that they went with uh, DMAA, right? Like geranium root. Like is yep. that, that the idea yep. with it? They claim that exemption. And then I think that's still currently being litigated. There's still or litigation. Yeah, there. I think there is still litigation going back and forth on that, although I think there was recently a, uh, a criminal matter that um, involved DMAA and part of the, the basis for that, as I understand, was that it's not a dietary supplement ingredient. Um, yeah, things can get murky and there are uh, some who will argue that the exemption 
doesn't require them to bring a particular uh, ingredient to the attention of FDA in advance. Um, and a company that does that obviously runs the risk that FDA can feel otherwise and can wind up in litigation. Uh, some other companies are actually trying to do a different route to bring a product to market that was that contains an ingredient that wasn't on the market prior to 94 by having some sort of self-affirmed, uh, generally regarded as safe uh, dossier created for the product where they have a panel of folks uh, evaluate whether it meets the grass or generally regarded as safe criteria um, and creating a self-affirmed rather than presenting that to FDA. So there are a few different ways that, that companies can um, can try to bring a new dietary ingredient to market, uh, but certainly throwing stuff in a bottle and uh, and not uh, adhering to any of these sorts of things and not applying good manufacturing practices is a recipe that endangers the public and ultimately can result in uh, serious enforcement action. I'm, I'm very glad you brought up the self-affirmed, uh, generally recognized as safe concept, because mm -hmm. I was reading about it the other day. Is there any FDA guidance regarding who can be involved in the creation of that dossier? Like who is an expert that can actually make that ruling or that determination on behalf of a company? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've, it's, a, it's a murky area where I've heard different people claiming, you know, what will satisfy the, um, the requirements for a panel for, uh, you know, what constitutes uh, grass, self-affirmed grass as an alternative. I think FDA generally frowns upon the self-affirmed grass route as an alternative to NDI notification for dietary supplement ingredients. Um, and this is a fairly new development uh, the last few years that companies have been sort of doing it. Um, I, I would suspect that FDA might, you know, some at FDA probably see it as an end run around the notification process and so might hold it to a higher standard. Um, you know, one of the problems is that while FDA certainly has the regulatory authority to police very aggressively the dietary supplement uh, industry, the question is always resources, right? I mean, how many in inspectors are out there? How many audits can be done? Uh, what is the size of, of the resources uh, that, that FDA has to go after the bad actors in the industry? And probably better funding would allow FDA to do more. And this is something, Eric, that that is goes back and forth as a debate in the industry, uh, for quite some time, and that is whether we need higher new laws and higher levels of regulation over the industry where Congress has to get involved or there need to be new regulations or whether the current laws and regulations are more than sufficient and it's really just a matter of enforcement, of giving FDA enough money, uh, enough resources to be able to go after the bad actors. Yeah. And that kind of gets back to the the original premises, you know, if we ratchet up the enforcement to a certain level, you know, how much of that cost goes to the taxpayer versus the company? And at what point, if companies are, are bearing some of that cost, at what point do they no longer become viable? Um, because the, I mean, the profit margins on a lot of these supplement projects, uh, products are already quite slim, are they not? Right. Well, it depends on the product, certainly. You know, pills would have typically a, a higher um, return, you know, better profit margin than powders, for example. But yeah, you're right. You know, at what point is the is the regulatory uh, requirement level too much for little companies to survive? On the other hand, you know, there's also an obligation on industry to do the right thing and and to some extent to self regulate. And that's been a problem, whether it's been, you know, putting aside even DMAA as a uh, as a ingredient in question. There were certainly ingredients that didn't fit the 
criteria to be a dietary supplement ingredient, but yet we're launched on the market and particularly in the sports nutrition space and proliferated. I mean, looking back, probably in the late 90s, uh, Andro hit the market, right? And then you had following Andro, you had a whole bunch of other steroidal precursor products, um, androstenedione dione being at least arguably in the food supply and a natural hormone in our bodies. But there were an increasing number of steroidal substances that were purely synthetic that were launched on the market in 2000 to 2004 and that range that yeah. there was no argument that a lot of those products were not simply unapproved drugs and had no business being put into a dietary supplement product. And, you know, one of the interesting things about the sports nutrition market is that a lot of the consumers really don't care whether the product contains something that fits the definition of a dietary supplement ingredient or not. The question is, will it work? <laughs> you know, <Right. laughs> and, yeah. uh, and if it if it will add you know ten pounds of muscle uh, in over a period of time, or or give me an extra half inch on my biceps, then you know give me two bottles. And right. so you had the pro hormone market really took off and. If you remember, there were congressional hearings about how it is members of Congress just couldn't wrap their heads around. How is it that these steroids are sold in a bottle and, and marketed as dietary supplement products? What's wrong with, with the law? And there was even talk about modifying the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. But ultimately, there was instead a, a new law that was passed in 2004 to try to crack down on the pro-hormone market, um, which was a failed law, if you remember it. It was a, a new incarnation of the 1990 Anabolic Steroid Control Act that listed a bunch more pro-hormone products, a bunch more ingredients, but didn't really change the catch-all. And so what you had was after that, uh, crafty chemists in the dietary supplement industry just came up with new steroidal ingredients <laughs> and brought those to market. And it yeah. wasn't until December of, of 2014 that the Designer Anabolic Steroid Control Act uh, was passed and signed into law. And at that point now, the, the pro-hormone market was pretty much decimated by an expanded definition of what a supplement, uh, what, a, what an anabolic steroid um, is and, and included a lot of supplement uh, type uh, ingredients that had been on the market. Yeah. And so, so do you think that new legislation in 2014 has essentially wiped out that whole pro-hormone and a uh, designer steroid kind of market? Pretty much, pretty much, um, because it really it, it talks not only about the the structure of of ingredients, but it talks about marketing issues as well. So it, it really has has cracked down enormously. Um, but it's interesting, you know. There's, I say to people about narcotics that whether you, whatever laws you put into place for addictive type narcotic drugs, there's a certain percentage of the human genome that wants to get high. And however you legislate it, however you enforce it, it's probably going to be a, a similar percentage because that's, you know, people, it, it, it's simple demand and, and supply. And so it's one of the reasons why I think the the war on drugs, which we've now put well over a trillion dollars into since it was declared by by President Nixon, uh, has really done very little to reduce the demand for narcotics. Yeah. And in the same way, frankly, I think there's a certain percentage of the human genome that wants to get jacked. <laughs> right. And that demand is going to be there regardless of what Congress, FDA, DEA, or anybody else tries to do. And so case in point, the, when the pro-hormone industry was, was really knocked down in, 
you know, by by the the various incarnations of the amended laws, you had the growth of this new product line. Uh, suddenly, new substances were hit to replace the prohormones, and those were SARMs. So you had yeah. the SARMs market, and 15 years ago, most people in the fitness industry had never heard of a SARM. And now with the creation and, and testing of, of Anobisarm, um, Osterine, um, you suddenly had this new class of chemicals that were not steroids, that were not uh, regulated by the Design or Anabolic Steroid Control Act, but purportedly had somewhat similar effects to steroids on performance and um, hypertrophy. And so suddenly you had a SARMS market that really got pretty large and pretty out of control for a period of time. And um, it's just another example that the consumers continue to demand in the sports nutrition space products that build muscle and um and so even now as as the sarms market and sarms being selective androgen receptor modulators most of your listeners are probably familiar with this class of of substances that um selectively stimulate the androgen receptor in bone and muscle without stimulating the stuff you don't want to stimulate, right? I mean, right, steroids yeah. stimulate things that we don't, we don't, we want to leave alone. You know, the prostate, nobody needs a bigger prostate, you know, it's fine <laughs> just as it is, right? Uh, nobody needs yeah. their scalp to be stimulated to, to start losing hair. Nobody wants more back hair, right? Nobody needs some right. acne on their back. So uh, by selectively stimulating only the areas that we want, muscle, bone, it's, it's a cleaner, more direct way to build muscle. And so a lot of bodybuilders jumped on the bandwagon. The problem, of course, is that these are drugs. They don't fit the definition of a dietary supplement ingredient. They have no business being on the dietary supplement market. Um, and so... And some of them are, are being researched as prescription drugs. Others have no real research into safety or efficacy. And so, you know, you're, you're dealing with the great unknown. And obviously, if, if these are unapproved drugs, which effectively they are, they shouldn't be being sold and purchased over the Internet. But that that has happened. And. And we're now beginning to see some enforcement actions uh, about that and some folks being uh, prosecuted over that and arrested. And so, um, you know, it's another example of sort of the darker side of the sports nutrition industry, which, um, you know, continues, uh, uh, you know, based on demand. Yeah. Now, now the SARM thing is interesting um, cause you mentioned it did kind of, once pro hormones were out of the game, the SARMs kind of moved in. Is that SARM market starting to contract again as the FDA sends out more letters and actually pursues criminal charges yeah. or, or are they still, still pretty prevalent out there? Uh, I, I think what happens is it's a bell curve where a, a class of ingredients that is questionable or if not downright illegal uh, begins to get traction. And the, when some companies start getting out there and making some money, then others start jumping in. And before you know it, there's a flood on the market. And then a few start getting targeted with warning letters or, as we may have recently heard, even some uh, indictments. And yeah, then, like a week ago, right? Right. And then little by little, uh, the the risk takers begin to get cold feet and they start getting out of it. But I guess if we learn anything from the history of the sports nutrition market, it's that consumers demand products that make them leaner, bigger, stronger. And so 
when one category contracts, if the demand for the effects continue, a new category will replace it. I don't know what's going to replace SARMs, but if you look at the history of the market, something will. Yeah. And, and that's a great point. You mentioned things start going away when they catch heat and new things come in. We kind of saw that with kind of the long-term history of pro-hormones and designer steroids. Once certain compounds were catching a lot of heat, they would just tweak it and come out with a similar compound. Right. We've seen something like that with the stimulant side of things. Yep. I know um, Peter Cohen at Harvard has published a lot of studies finding first he focused on DMAA, but now in the last couple of years or last few years, a lot of similar stimulants that probably don't fit the FDA definition of supplement. Right. Um, is your sense uh, that the um, a lot of those stimulants have kind of seen their day now that they're under the spotlight or, or is that still a prevalent concern? Yeah, I think that I mean, if you want to even take it back a step, there was ephedra, right, back in the day. Sure. And you had this this herbal stimulant product uh, that, you know, was derived from um, a, a botanical that, that people have been using for centuries. And uh, millions of servings uh, across the country used um, but FDA had reports of adverse uh, health effects. And um, in, uh, in 2004, FDA banned ephedra. So you had this stimulant, this fat burner that people were you know, demanding that was now off the market. And I think DMAA, you know, one, the 1,3-dimethyl, one dimethyl was a what became sort of the the go-to, you know, the substitute for when when ephedra went bye-bye. And then as DMAA got more and more heat from the FDA, you then had, as you said, these alternatives. So you had DMBA, you know, uh, an analog, close, closely related chemical. And then you had BMPEA and these other... Um, sort of substitutes for, you know, to, to meet the demand of people who want a pre-workout or a stimulant uh, product or a fat burning product. Um, but as, as you, you alluded to, FDA doesn't like these other ingredients either. And so FDA actually did send out warning letters uh, with respect to both of those uh, ingredients. FDA even sent out warning letters uh, a couple of years ago on methylsinephrine and saying that it's, it's, it's a misbranded uh, product if it contains that. So I think we're going to continue to sort of see folks coming out with a pre-workout uh, stimulant, looking for botanicals that, um, that may have some an ingredient that is effective and uh, what those will be, I don't know. I've heard, you know, talk within the industry that, that different folks are coming out with Duchet compliant stimulant ingredients. Um, and uh, I think that that will continue to be sort of one of the one of the two holy grails in the sports nutrition industry, something that is a Duchet compliant but effective pre-workout fat burning stimulant ingredient and something that is a Duchet compliant, effective bodybuilding, um, you know, hyperf- hypertrophy stimulating uh, ingredient. Oh, that'd be, it'd be huge. Right. Now, every time uh, you, you hear an athlete, and in some cases, even, you know, people who are subject to employee drug testing, mm-hmm. you, you hear about it more with athletes, but it's almost like the automatic response of a failed drug test is tainted supplement. Right. Right. Yeah. How often is that an easy scapegoat? And and how often do you actually think that's a a credible excuse? Well, I've done a lot of drug testing cases. I've represented uh, student athletes in NCAA 
uh, doping cases. I've represented professional athletes. Um, I've gotten many, many calls from folks who have failed drug tests and want me to look into how they failed it. Um, and they'll tell me, you know, Rick, uh, I, I didn't take what they're claiming that I tested positive for. I don't know how it happened. And I want to fight it. I want to try to, you know, appeal this finding. And the drug testing system, the anti-doping system that we have is interesting. You know, like I said, I come from a background in, in criminal justice as a prosecutor and then as a defense lawyer where you're presumed innocent, right? You know, and, and it's uh, unless and until you are found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, you have, or you're cloaked in that presumption of innocence. With these drug testing cases, the, the way that the anti-doping system works is sort of the opposite. You are tested, and if your A and your B sample are both positive for some metabolite in your body that suggests that you took a, a banned substance, you're basically guilty, and your remedy is an appeal. Without ever having had a trial, you're now in a position of appeal, and where usually in criminal justice, you have to have a guilty mind, where what we call mens rea, in other words, some intent or at least recklessness or knowledge. In drug testing, it's a different standard. It's what's called strict liability, meaning basically if that substance is in your urine, you are accountable for it. And it doesn't matter how it got there. It doesn't even matter if you didn't intend for it to be there. And so that's a tough standard. Strict liability is a very harsh standard. And uh, basically, you're accountable. And it's very hard to win on an appeal. Um, now, there are situations where certainly athletes take a drug, let's say an anabolic steroid, and then try to claim that they took a supplement. It's kind of like the dog ate my homework right. Uh, right. excuse, right? You know, everybody wants to blame the supplement. And what percentage of that is true? I don't know. I think probably in, in most cases, if somebody tests positive for a substance um, that's a performance-enhancing banned substance, it's probably because they, they took it. But that doesn't mean that it's true for everybody. Right. And I have seen many cases where people didn't intentionally take something and they tested positive. And we've even seen that in the news. The first one was Kicker Wenzel, the Olympic swimmer, many, many years ago, who took a multivitamin and tested positive for a steroid due to quality control problems in the manufacture of that product. And he sued and he won a ton of money in a lawsuit against the, the company that uh, was responsible for that product because he wound up uh, losing his Olympic opportunities. Yeah. Yes, the Hardy, another Olympic athlete who was actually uh, a pitch person for a particular supplement line and then wound up testing positive for clenbuterol, which is a, a beta-2 agonist a, uh, used as a bronchodilator in some countries, uh, but banned in sports because of its stimulatory effect. She winds up testing positive for clenbuterol, uh, and, and they find out, lo and behold, it was in the supplement that she was pitching for. Yeah. So uh, it does happen. I represented a pro boxer a few years ago called Sam Solomon, the number one ranked middleweight boxer in the world who uh, fought the German champion Felix Sturm in Dusseldorf, Germany, beat the daylights out of him, and then tested positive for methylsinephrine. And he had no idea how he got methylsinephrine in his body because he didn't take anything that would have caused it. And we found out that there was a supplement product that he took that um, – was the source of his positive. And, um, and so it does happen that there are quality control issues. A, a number of years ago, I actually represented a, um, a individual in a criminal case who had a dietary supplement company and was actually intentionally spiking his pre-workout products 
with clenbuterol in the after hours when everybody else had left the manufacturing facility. Wow. He was putting some in there in order to give some extra bang for, you know, some bang for the buck in his um, stimulant products. And ultimately, it was uh, confirmed and he was found out and he wound up uh, needing to be held accountable for it in a federal criminal case. So these things do happen. There are quality control issues, uh, whether it's at the manufacturing level, at the raw material uh, level, um, whether it's in some cases intentional spiking or mislabeling. So athletes can test positive. And um, one thing that uh, that folks can do, there are some certification programs that will offer a seal that suggests that the product has uh, does not have banned substances at least because there's been some testing done for those sorts of banned substances i know informed choice has a program nsf has a program the banned substance control group has a certification seal that um, it offers to dietary supplement companies as a third-party service. So if you have a, a sports nutrition product and you want to make sure it, it is it is not going to have a positive effect on a drug test, you can submit your products to one of those companies and get a certification. And that at least lets drug-tested athletes know what to look for if they're in the marketplace for a product. And you also sometimes recommend um, holding on to a dose or two of your old supplements in some cases. Is that right? I do. I tell people that um, just based on my experience, so you may wind up finishing a particular product and then you throw the bottle away. And now a month later, you wind up being asked to submit to a drug test and you test positive. And then you come to me and you say, Rick, I, I need help. I'm being charged with a, a, a doping violation. And uh, I didn't take what they're saying uh, I took. And um, and if we look at it and we, we see, hey, wow, this is an ingredient that I've sometimes seen in dietary supplement products as a contaminant in trace amounts. And that could be the source of your positive. Give me the uh, some you know, retained samples from what you were taking. Give me a list of what you were taking and I can send it out and I typically will send it out to Oliver Catlin at the Banned Substance Control Group and Oliver will, will do some tests on the product and if in fact we find that the product was contaminated with the exact substance that caused the positive, we're in a pretty good shape to either get a, an exoneration in some sports or at a minimum a reduction in the in any sort of suspension even though it's in the urine if i can show that it really was something the athlete um, did his due diligence on or her due diligence and it was a contaminant you you can have some success in in any sports in in doping appeals uh, but when you're told by the athlete well i threw everything away i don't have any of that well that that makes a problem um, what i usually do is if there's a bit of a, a retained sample, I'll have it sent over to Oliver. And if that tests positive, then I'll be able to also look on the bottle and see what the batch, the, the lot number is for the product. And I'll go out and try to get a sealed container of the same batch and also have that tested so that we can rebut any argument. Well, you know, you just sprinkled a little of that substance into the product in the bottle into that powder or into a capsule in order to make it look like the product was contaminated. So I'll try to get a sealed bottle of the same lot. But if you threw everything away, I can't even know what batch or lot to look for. Right. So, so for people listening along, we've kind of established, this has been a, I mean, an hour of just gold and audio, a lot of good information here. We've kind of gone over how the FDA has the and the federal government in other areas as well, the ability to regulate this industry. We've talked about things consumers can do using third party certification, retaining samples. Um, so at, at the very least, hopefully we can get this out and help people realize exactly the what is uh, where oversights provided and where some of that burden is on the consumer. Now, my final question for you, we've talked a little bit about 
kind of cleaning up the um, the enforcement in terms of oversight. Do you think it is just enforcing what's already on the books, just allocating a little more funding, or, or do you think more legislation is needed down the pipeline? I think there's enough uh, legislation on the books to cover the vast majority of problems in the market. And overall, if we really compare the, the negative uh, health effects the risks involved in contaminated products and things like that. There's lots of problems in the food um, chain, uh, supply chain as well, as well as prescription drugs. We've seen recalls of prescription drugs. We've seen all sorts of problems with salmonella and food and other things. So God, they, they while, recall um, lettuce like twice a week now. <laughs> exactly. It seems that way. So I guess the, the, the point is, you know, while sometimes I think that uh, certainly, there there are issues and problems in the sports nutrition and supplement industry. There are some bad actors, but I think they're typically not the norm. I think it's a small percentage of bad actors. And if you look overall, the supplement industry is not this wild west uh, as it exists today with GMPs and everything else. And I don't think that we need to hammer it. I think comparatively, this dietary supplement market is safe as compared in some ways to both food and to drugs. And so I don't think we need more legislation. I think we have enough. Uh, I do think that there might be some amendments to the law when it comes to certain ingredients. And I'm thinking specifically about cannabidiol. Um, as you probably know, one of the biggest developments in the dietary supplement ingredient widely, but even now into the sports nutrition industry mm -hmm. is CBD. CBD is appearing now in major retail health food stores. Um, uh, drug stores are now carrying it. A, a local mom and pop drug store nor, near me has a whole wall of CBD products. The problem, of course, is that FDA says CBD is not a lawful dietary supplement ingredient. You can't sell it as a dietary supplement ingredient, according to FDA. Yeah. And there's been some developments. There's a, a new law, the, the Farm Act of, of uh, uh, recent Farm Act of 2018, um, which which takes some of the some of the problems away from selling CBD. At least takes the DEA out of the equation for in, in most situations, but that doesn't mean that the FDA has backed off its position. And so there's a, um, a, a very fertile area for potential legislation, regulation, and potential enforcement in the area of CBD. And I, I'm now getting calls and, and my firm represents a lot of companies in the sports nutrition space. Um, from startups to established businesses who are looking to do the right thing, who are looking to comply with the law, who want their products to be uh, in compliance with Deshay, to be made under good GMPs, and who will call me and say, Rick, I want to introduce a CBD product. What, what can I do? And, and what is the current law about that? And I want to put it in my post-workout or my pre-workout. Um, and certainly, there's interest in CBD and sports nutrition because of the potential for the you know, enhanced recovery um, and anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, those are sort of what, what the sports nutrition companies are looking into and looking at. But there are problems because right now, the way FDA sees it, CBD oil is not a lawful ingredient. And there are also problems with potential drug testing because Obviously, THC, which is also a, um, a compound found in cannabis, which is the same plant that um, hemp and marijuana come from, and obviously CBD is an extract from the hemp um, you know, cannabis, yeah. but uh, if you test positive for THC, um, you can wind up losing either 
a sports uh, ability to compete in sports or a, an award that you've won in sports or or even your job because if you're a cop or a firefighter or if you're on probation and you're taking a CBD product at this point there are questions as far as how much of that product you can take before the trace amounts of THC in that CBD product might cause you to test positive for THC. Right. And I tell you what, Rick, there are several things I love about you, but one of them is that I had a list of things to cover in this podcast. The final one we hadn't gotten to was CBD. <laughs> and See, I'm also a mind reader, Eric, which is one of my... Um hidden talent yeah, in the 11th hour you <laughs> squeeze it in there i think it's probably because i've learned everything i know, I know about regulation from your materials so I, I think it was uh it, it just had to go that way well um, thank you so it, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on absolutely i had a great time i appreciate you having me on the show eric and um, if any of your listeners want to uh, see what i'm up to the places they can find me, uh, if they're in the supplement industry, Supplement Council, and Council is C-O-U-N-S-E-L dot com. Supplementcouncil.com is a good place to see what I'm doing. Um, I also still maintain my site at steroidlaw.com, and steroidlaw.com is a place where you can really get a, a handle on what the laws are with respect to anabolic steroids and it also has a blog uh, as a supplement council that uh, kind of keeps people posted on on new things i've written and new things i've done and i've got a very active uh instagram account at rick collins esq so if you're out there and you're on ig please uh pop by and uh, follow me i appreciate that uh, i have a twitter feed and um and you can even find my public facebook page at rick collins online uh Facebook uh, backslash Rick Collins online. And I hopefully um, I wish you uh, e enormous success with uh, with the show, Eric. And uh, hopefully I I can come back again. I'd love to do that. There is an open invitation. And if you're listening along, all those ways to get in touch with Rick, check them out. Because as you probably picked up in this episode, the supplement landscape is ever changing. And if you understand it now, in three months, the whole thing's probably going to be different. It's There's going to be new ingredients that are in gray areas, new findings. So keep an eye on everything Rick puts out. Um, what he puts out is the legal standard when it comes to steroid law and supplement law. Thank you so much for listening along, and we will see you guys on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Stronger by Science podcast. Now, Greg and I are not experts in medicine or health or really anything else for that matter. So before you make any changes to your diet and exercise habits, make sure you check with a doctor or another healthcare professional. If you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to support it, visit strongerbyscience.com to check out the products and services that we offer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.